it is not so difficult to live the life that leads to heaven as is believed by Emanuel Swedenborg. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It is not so difficult to live the life that leads to heaven as is believed. 528. Some believe that to live the life that leads to heaven, which is called spiritual life, is difficult, because they have been told that man must renounce the world, divest himself of the lusts called lusts of the body and flesh, and live spiritually. And by this they understand that they must reject worldly things, which consist chiefly in riches and honor, that they must walk continually in pious meditation about God, about salvation, and about eternal life, and that they must pass their life in prayers and in reading the word and pious books. This they suppose to be renouncing the world and living in the spirit and not in the flesh. But by much experience and from conversation with angels, I have learned that this is not so at all, and indeed that they who renounce the world and live in the spirit in this manner procure to themselves a sorrowful life, which is not receptive of heavenly joy for every one's life remains with him. But in order that man may receive the life of heaven, he must needs live in the world and engage in its business and employments, and then by moral and civil life receive spiritual life. In no other way can spiritual life be formed with man or his spirit prepared for heaven. For to live internal life and not external at the same time is like dwelling in a house without any foundation, which gradually either sinks or becomes full of chinks and breaches, or totters till it falls. 529. If the life of man be viewed and explored by rational intuition, it is found to be threefold, namely spiritual, moral, and civil, and these three lives to be distinct from each other for there are men who live a civil life, and yet not a moral and spiritual life, and there are men who live a moral life, and still not a spiritual, and there are those who live both a civil life and a moral life, and at the same time a spiritual life. The latter are they who live the life of heaven, but the former are they who live the life of the world, separate from the life of heaven. Hence it may be evident in the first place that spiritual life is not separate from natural life or from the life of the world, but is conjoined with it as a soul with its body, and that if it were separated it would be, as already said, like dwelling in a house without any foundation. For moral and civil life is the activity of spiritual life, since it is of spiritual life to will well, and of moral and civil life to act well. And if the latter be absent, then spiritual life consists merely in thought and speech, and will vanishes, because without support. And yet will is the very spiritual part of man. 530. That it is not so difficult as is believed to live the life which leads to heaven may be seen from what now follows. Who cannot live a civil life and moral life, since every one from childhood is initiated into it, and from life in the world is acquainted with it? Every one who does lead such a life, the bad as well as the good, for who does not wish to be called sincere, and who does not wish to be called just? Almost all practice sincerity and justice outwardly, so far as to appear as it were sincere and just in heart or as if they acted from real sincerity and justice. The spiritual man should live in like manner, which he can do as easily as the natural man, but with this difference only, that he believes in the divine, and acts sincerely and justly not merely because it is according to civil and moral laws, but also because it is according to divine laws. For the spiritual man, because he thinks about divine things when he acts, communicates with the angels of heaven, and so far as he does this, is conjoined with them, and thus his internal man is opened, which viewed in itself is a spiritual man. 
When man is of such a character, he is then adopted and led by the Lord while he himself is not aware of it, and then in doing acts of sincerity and justice which are of moral and civil life, he does them from a spiritual origin. And to do what is sincere and just from a spiritual origin is to do it from sincerity and justice itself, or to do it from the heart. His justice and sincerity in outward form appear quite like the justice and sincerity with natural man, even with evil and infernal man, but in inward form they are wholly unlike. For evil men act justly and sincerely merely for the sake of themselves and the world, and therefore if they did not fear the law and its penalties, also the loss of reputation, of honor, of gain, and of life, they would act altogether insincerely and unjustly, since they neither fear God nor any divine law, and so are not restricted by any internal bond. They would therefore, in such case, to the utmost of their power, defraud, plunder, and spoil others, and this from enjoyment. That they are inwardly of this nature is very apparent from those of this kind in the other life, where every one's externals are removed and his internals are opened, in which he then lives to eternity. Such persons, as they then act without external restraints, fear of the law, of the loss of reputation, of honor, of gain, and of life, act insanely and laugh at sincerity and justice. But they who have acted sincerely and justly from regard to divine laws, when their externals are taken away and they are left to their internals, act wisely, because they are conjoined with angels of heaven, from whom wisdom is communicated to them. From these things it may now be evident that the spiritual man can act quite like the natural man as to civil and moral life, provided he be conjoined to the divine, as to his internal man, or as to his will and thought. 531. The laws of spiritual life, the laws of civil life, and the laws of moral life are also delivered in the ten precepts of the Decalogue. In the first three, the laws of spiritual life. In the following four, the laws of civil life. And in the last three, the laws of moral life. The merely natural man lives in outward form according to the same precepts in like manner as the spiritual man, for he in like manner worships the divine, goes to church, listens to preachings, composes his face to devotion. He does not commit murder, nor adultery, nor theft, does not bear false witness, does not defraud his companions of their goods. But all this he does merely for the sake of himself and the world, to keep up appearances. And the same person in inward form is just opposite to what he appears outwardly, since in heart he denies the divine, in worship acts the hypocrite, and when left to himself and his own thoughts, laughs at the holy things of the church, believing that they merely serve as a restraint for the simple multitude. Consequently, he is wholly disjoined from heaven, and so, because he is not a spiritual man, he is neither a moral man nor a civil man. For even though he does not commit murder, still he hates every one who opposes him, and from hatred burns with revenge against him. So that if he were not restrained by civil laws and external bonds, which are fears, he would kill him. And because he lusts after this, it follows that he is continually committing murder. Albeit he does not commit adultery, still, inasmuch as he believes it allowable, he is all the while an adulterer. For as far as he can and has opportunity, he commits it. Although he does not steal, yet he covets the goods of others. In regards fraud and evil acts as not contrary to civil law, in intent he is continually acting the thief. The case is similar as to the precepts of moral life, which teach not to bear false witness, and not to covet the goods of others. Such is the nature of every man who denies the divine, and who has not a conscience grounded in religion. 
that such as his real nature appears manifestly from those who are of this sort in the other life when on the removal of their externals they are left to their internals then since they are separated from heaven they act in unity with hell and so are in fellowship with those who are in hell it is otherwise with those who have in heart acknowledged the divine and in the acts of their lives have had respect to divine laws and have acted according to the first three precepts of the decalogue equally as according to the rest when these on the removal of externals are let into their internals they are wiser than when in the world for when they come into their internals it is like coming from shade into light from ignorance into wisdom and from a sorrowful life into a blessed one inasmuch as they are in the divine thus in heaven these things are said to the intent that it may be known what the one kind of man and what the other really is though both have lived a similar external life five thirty two every one may know that thoughts are conveyed and tend according to intentions or whither a man intends for the thought is man's inward sight which is like the outward sight in this that to whatever point it is bent and intended thither it turns and there it rests if therefore the inner sight or thought is turned to the world and rests there it follows that the thought becomes worldly if turned to self and self-honor it becomes corporeal but if it is turned to heaven it follows that it becomes heavenly and consequently is elevated if to self it is drawn down from heaven and immersed in what is corporeal and if to the world it is also bent down from heaven and is diffused upon those objects which are before the eyes it is man's love which makes his intention and which determines his internal sight or thought to its objects thus the love of self to self and its objects the love of the world to worldly objects and the love of heaven to heavenly objects thus it may be known what is the state of man's interiors which are of his mind provided his love be known namely that the interiors of him who loves heaven are elevated toward heaven and are open above and that the interiors of him who loves the world and of him who loves himself are closed upwards and are open outward from this it may be concluded that if the higher regions of the rational mind are closed upward man can no longer see the objects which are of heaven and the church and those objects are with him in thick darkness and the things which are in thick darkness are either denied or not understood hence it is that they who love themselves and the world above all things since the higher regions of their minds are closed in heart deny divine truths and if they speak at all about them from memory still they do not understand them they regard them also in the same manner as they regard worldly and corporeal things such being their nature they can give attention only to the things that enter through the senses of the body with which they are alone delighted among which are many things that are likewise filthy obscene profane and wicked these cannot be removed because with such persons there is no influx from heaven into their minds which are closed above as was said man's intention from which his internal sight or thought is determined is his will for what a man wills he intends and what he intends he thinks if therefore his intention is toward heaven his thought is determined thither and with it his whole mind which is thus in heaven whence he then sees the things of the world beneath him as one looking down from a roof hence the man who has the interiors of his mind open can see the evils and falsities that are with him for these are beneath the spiritual mind and on the other hand the man whose interiors are not open cannot see his own evils and falsities because he is in them and not above them from these things we may conclude whence man has wisdom and whence insanity 
also what he will be after death when he is left to will and think, and also to act and speak according to his interiors. These things are said also that it may be known what a man is interiorly, however he may appear outwardly like another. 533. That it is not so difficult to live the life of heaven as is believed is evident now from this, that it is only necessary for man to think when anything presents itself to him which he knows to be insincere and unjust, and to which he is inclined, that it ought not to be done because it is contrary to the divine precepts. If man accustoms himself so to think, and from so accustoming himself acquires a habit, he then by degrees is conjoined to heaven and so far as he is conjoined to heaven, the higher regions of his mind are opened, and so far as those are opened, he sees what is insincere and unjust, and so far as he sees these evils, so far may they be shaken off, for no evil can be shaken off until it is seen. This is the state into which man may enter from free will, for who is not able from free will to think in this manner? But when he has made a beginning, then the Lord quickens all that is good in him and causes him not only to see evils as evils, but also not to will them, and finally to be averse to them. This is meant by the Lord's words, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew 11.30 it is, however, to be known that the difficulty of so thinking, and likewise of resisting evils, increases in so far as man from the will commits them, for just so far he accustoms himself to them, until at length he does not see them, and afterwards loves them, and from the enjoyment of love excuses them, and by all kinds of fallacies confirms them, saying that they are allowable and good. But this is the case with those who in the age of early youth plunge into evils without restraint, and then at the same time reject divine things from the heart. 534. There was once represented to me the way which leads to heaven and that which leads to hell. There was a broad way extending to the left or the north, and many spirits appeared going in it but at a distance was seen a large stone where the broad way came to an end. From that stone went afterward two ways, one to the left and one in the opposite direction to the right. The way that extended to the left was narrow or straight, leading through the west to the south and thus into the light of heaven. The way that extended to the right was broad and spacious, leading obliquely downward toward hell. All at first seemed to go the same way, until they came to the stone at the head of the two ways. But when they came to that point, they were divided. The good turned to the left and entered the straight way that led to heaven. But the evil did not see the stone and fell upon it and were hurt. And when they rose up, they ran on in the broad way to the right, which extended to hell. It was afterward explained to me what all these things signified. In the first way that was brought, in which many, both good and evil, went together and conversed with one another as friends, because no difference between them was apparent to the sight, were represented by those who in externals live alike sincerely and justly, and who are not distinguished to the sight. By the stone at the head of the two ways, or at the corner, upon which the evil fell, and from which they then ran into the way leading to hell, was represented divine truth, which is denied by those who look toward hell, and in the supreme sense by the same stone was signified the divine human of the Lord, and they who acknowledged divine truth, and at the same time the divine of the Lord, were led on by way that led to heaven. From these things it was again made plain that in externals the wicked lead the same kind of life as the good, or go the same way, thus one as easily as the other, and yet that they who acknowledge the divine from the heart, especially they within the church who acknowledge the divine of the Lord, are led to heaven, 
and they who do not acknowledge are brought to hell. The thoughts of man which proceed from intention or will are represented in the other life by ways. Ways also are there presented to appearance just according to the thoughts of intention, and every one likewise walks according to his thoughts that proceed from intention. Hence it is that the quality of spirits and of their thoughts is known from their ways. From these words it was likewise evident what is meant by the Lord's words. Enter ye in through the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there are who go in thereat. Narrow is the way, and straight the gate which leadeth to life, and few there are who find it. Matthew seven, thirteen and 14. That the way is narrow which leads to life is not because it is difficult, but because there are few who find it, as is here said. From the stone seen at the corner where the broad and common way terminated, and from which two ways were seen to lead in opposite directions, it was made evident what is signified by the words of the Lord. Have ye not read what is written? The stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken. Luke twenty, seventeen and 18. Stone signifies divine truth, and the stone of Israel, the Lord, as to the divine human. The builders are they who are of the church. The head of the corner is where the two ways are. To fall and to be broken is to deny and perish. 535. It has been granted me to speak with some in the other life who had removed themselves from worldly affairs, that they might live piously and holily, and likewise with some who had afflicted themselves by various methods, because they believed that this was to renounce the world and subdue the lusts of the flesh. But most of these, inasmuch as they had thus contracted a sorrowful life, and had removed themselves from the life of charity, which life can only be led in the midst of the world, cannot be consociated with angels, because the life of angels is a life of gladness from bliss, and consists in performing good deeds, which are works of charity. Moreover, they who have led a life abstracted from worldly employments, are excited with the idea of their own merits, and are continually desiring heaven on this account, and thinking of heavenly joy as a reward, not knowing at all what heavenly joy is. And when they are introduced among angels and into their joy, which is without merit and consists in active labors and practical services, and in blessedness from the good which they thereby perform, they are surprised like persons who discover something quite foreign to their belief, and since they are not receptive of that joy, they depart and ally themselves with spirits of their own kind, who have lived a similar life in the world. But they who have lived an outwardly holy life, being continually in temples and engaged in prayers, and who have afflicted their souls, and at the same time have thought continually of themselves that they would for this be esteemed and honored before others, and in the end after death be accounted saints in the other life, are not in heaven, because they have done such things for the sake of themselves. And since they have defiled divine truths by the self-love in which they have immersed them, some of them are so insane as to think themselves gods, on which account they are in hell among those like themselves. Some are cunning and deceitful, and are in the hells of the deceitful. These are they who have made such pretenses in outward conduct by cunning arts and craftiness, and by this means have induced the common people to believe that a divine sanctity was in them. Of this character are many of the Roman Catholic saints, with some of whom also it has been granted me to speak, and then their life was plainly portrayed as it had been in the world, and as it was afterward. 
These things are stated in order that it may be known that the life which leads to heaven is not a life abstracted from the world, but a life in the world, and that a life of piety without a life of charity, which is possible only in the world, does not lead to heaven, but a life of charity, which consists in acting sincerely and justly in every function, in every business, and in every work, from an interior thus from a heavenly motive and this motive is in that life when man acts sincerely and justly because it is according to the divine laws such a life is not difficult but a life of piety abstracted from a life of charity is difficult and yet it leads away from heaven as much as it is believed to lead toward heaven End of It is not so difficult to live the life that leads to heaven as is believed by Emanuel Swedenborg From Heaven and Its Wonders and Hell From Things Heard and Seen Published in Latin in 1758 Translated in 1892